Hello, I'm Sofia, and welcome to What We Need to Know About Ukraine. Here, I learn about Ukrainian history, literature, and culture, and share my findings with you. Today's episode is about a great and powerful medieval empire, the Kyivan Rus, and its surprisingly democratic humane laws, as well as one of its best-known kings, Yaroslav the Wise. Kyivan Rus is an Eastern European feudal monarchical state with its capital in Kiev, which existed during the 9th to the 13th centuries. The name Kyivan Rus is well established in historiography, but in contemporary resources it is known as the Land of Rus or simply Rus. And the languages that were spoken there were Old East Slavic and Church Slavonic. It is often contested whether Rus was Ukrainian or Russian, because of slightly similar names, or some other. But the answer is not so simple. The country was situated on the lands of present-day Ukraine, Moldova, Poland, Belarus, Russia, Romania, and Slovakia. But the majority of its land was in present-day Ukraine, and its capital was Kyiv, which is also Ukraine's capital today. And yet what matters most when thinking of national identity would be what the people at the time considered themselves to be. A person living in Kyiv at the time would consider themselves to be a Ruthenian, from Rus, um, Christian, and Kyivan, a person from Kyiv, that is. It was a time before nationalism, and people would sooner associate themselves with their religion and city rather than the state. Although I should note that a famous historian, Mikhail Khrushchevsky, even called the state Ukraine Rus in his works, for so it was. It brought so much to Ukrainian culture and identity, since it is our history, the history of our land, and of our ancestors. The history of Kyivian Rus can be divided into three parts, just like most states, which is the beginning and the rise of the state, then its golden age, and then the final period, which in this case is feudal fragmentation. Today, we will focus on the Golden Age by looking at a king who was in power during that time. The king I will talk of today was part of the Rudikovich dynasty, which came to power in 882. They also had power in other countries because of marriages. For example, they were connected to the Byzantine Empire that still called itself the Roman Empire in that way. The Ruthenian Empire itself was very powerful and well-known throughout Europe, as well as well-respected, and I will talk about that a little later. So, Yaroslav the Wise is the king that I will talk about today, and he was the son of Volodymyr the Great. Both were incredible kings of Rus, and very well-known. Yaroslav started ruling over part of his father's kingdom at just 15 years old, an interesting fact that I think is worth mentioning is that it is scientifically proven that Yaroslav was physically disabled. We know that since there are still remains of his body in Kiev. When his father passed away, there were massive fights for the throne between him and his siblings as they killed each other and tried to outmaneuver one another. We have to remember that these are the Middle Ages after all. Yaroslav's brother became king first, but with strong support from the populace and Scandinavia, Yaroslav won over the throne. When king, Yaroslav the Wise worked hard on international relations and made connections and ties and became allies with other European states. I think it's worth mentioning that Yaroslav the Wise was not his name. The nickname the Wise came to him after he lived, and of course he didn't call himself that. So, at the time of Yaroslav, which is in the early 11th century, Ruthenia was one of the most powerful European states. It was really well integrated with other European states as well, and their structures, and also at the same time really well integrated with the Byzantine Empire, which was considered elite at the time. Yaroslav the Wise had daughters, and they eventually became one, Queen of France, another of Hungary, another of Denmark, another of England, and another Queen of Norway. Yaroslav's wife was the daughter of the Swedish king. These women helped greatly with diplomacy in between the countries and were quite influential politically. For example, Anna of Kiev, who was the Queen of France, has ruled France as regent after her husband died and her son was too young to rule. 
women overall were politically active in the Kievan Rus. One of the most famous rulers of Rus was Queen Olha, and she definitely will have her own episode. Kyiv was really connected with the world of Scandinavia in general. Approximately half of the kings of the Kivian Rus had some Scandinavian roots. The British Isles were also under the Scandinavian influence, so Rus had strong ties with them as well. Overall, Yaroslav the Wise had many diplomatic connections all over Europe. Having family ties with the Rurikovich dynasty was prestigious, and many European rulers came to Rus to find a match for their children. Now, let's talk about the important changes Yaroslav the Wise did inside Rus, meaning his internal policy, and how did the state of Rus even function? During Yaroslav's rule, Kyiv became the biggest, richest, most advanced, and most powerful city in Eastern Europe, as well as one of the biggest, richest, most advanced, and most powerful cities in all of Europe. For example, London's population at the time was 10,000 people, and Kyiv's population was 50,000. Under him, Kyiv became the main political center of Eastern Europe and underwent significant architectural changes. So, let's take a small detour and talk about some places you should visit when you travel to Ukraine, and specifically Kyiv. There are so many architectural landmarks in Kyiv which are still standing and were built by Yaroslav the Wise around a thousand years ago. The St. Sophia Cathedral in Kyiv, Ukraine, which you can still visit today, is built by Yaroslav the Wise and was first opened in the year 1018. And of course, it's not the only architectural landmark that is still with us today from Yaroslav. The other is the Kyiv Pachersk Lavra, or in Ukrainian, Kyivo Pachersk Lavra, which is also known as the Kyiv Monastery of the Caves, and it was built in 1051. It is also the place where the monk Nestor Lutopisits compiled the earliest surviving chronicle about the Kyivan Rus. The Golden Gate of Kyiv was built in 1024, in imitation of the Golden Gate of Constantinople. And the current gate is mostly a reconstruction, but if you walk inside it, there are a few walls which are from the original. Okay, let's get back to the history. Not only the city of Kyiv, but the state of Rus itself was at its most powerful during Yaroslav's time and kept developing in all areas. The first original examples of literature appeared in Kyiv and Rus during that time. Education and culture developed widely, and the first codification of legal norms took place. It was at this time that the first legal code of the Kyiv Rus state was concluded, the Ruthenian Truth, which became a kind of foundation of the written legislation of the state. Yaroslav also made sure that the church is fully independent of the Roman Empire and the Pope. He does this by creating the Kivian Rus' own metropolitanate. An ethnically Ruthenian person is at the head of the church. The form of government of the Kivian Rus was considered a medieval monarchy, and power in it was exercised on the principle of vassalage. The relationship of vassality was characteristic of Europe, especially Western Europe. It meant that in Kyiv and Rus, the power of the king over the individual princes and their power over the boyars was minimal. Although the king of Kyiv was the king of the entire state, with the development of relations between the kings of Kyiv and the local princes or local kings, like Yaroslav was when he was 15 and his father was still alive, Treaties were concluded between them when trying to implement something new or to come to a conclusion, something like that. Of course, the king had the power over his kingdom and performed the most important functions like legislative, executive, judicial. He was the head of the army. He collected taxes and controlled the treasury. But he did not have absolute power. The ruling king, as it was needed, would gather the people's assembly called Vice which were an important organ and governmental authority. Vice helped resolve important public and state affairs. Vice was convened in large cities and in smaller towns and suburbs. Residents of smaller towns and suburbs had the right to participate in meetings of the larger cities near which they lived. Vice meetings were convened in the case of being needed by the king, boyars, 
or the initiative came from the people. So there was no need to wait for the king to call a meeting, and everyone could join in. The decision was made by shouting an approval or denial of a certain proposal. Whichever had the loudest shouting would win. The Ukrainian word for voting came from the shouting form of voting. This was the slightly democratic ruling system, which is surprising to find in the Middle Ages in Europe. The community consulted with the king in person, put forward their demands, and depending on their fulfillment, raised the issue of his stay in power. Vicha discussed and resolved various current issues, and in addition to approving and removing the kings from power, Vicha's powers included the decision of a foreign policy, peace and war, control over the administration and judiciary, as well as the summoning of the militia. In the Kyiv and Rus state, the law was formed as an important regulator of social relations, the most important sources of which were customs, customary law, statutes of the king, and lessons, and later, Ruthenian truth, and others. The Ruthenian law had a rather high level of development for the time, in particular in justice, progressiveness of humanity, compared to the Western European law. For example, there was no death penalty, suffering, or physically and mentally disabling types of punishments, no terrible treatment of women, etc. The Kyivan Rus was a very prosperous and progressive state for the Middle Ages, but it was also important for general European history and development. It had control over Eastern Europe and much influence in all of Europe. It is strange that it is not studied in history classes, and even more strange that when it is studied by Western historians, they focus solely on deciding to which modern country it belongs. The small amount of studies are heartbreaking, and hopefully people will soon begin to appreciate Kyiv and Rus for what it truly was, a powerful state with an intriguing history. Thank you so much for joining me today. And this is what we need to know about Ukraine this week.